Hello and welcome to today's seminar, Web to use XRF in pharma and cosmetics from raw material verification to monitoring of heavy metal impurities. My name is Frank Portala and I'd like to guide you through today's seminar. After a short introduction to XRF, we will show you how cosmetics application can be performed with XRF and we'll show you examples from the raw material verification to the final products. After that, we will switch to the lab and show you how EDXRF instrumentation is used in the cosmetics industries. Back in the studio, we will show you use cases of XRF in the pharmaceutical industry and then with a second lab session again, showing you the benchtop WDXRF instrumentation for the pharmaceutical industry. And at the end of our seminar, we will have a Q&A session with our experts. Today's speakers are Kai Behrens and Adrian Fiege from the product management team, and then Renata Janic, who will cover the lab sessions and the instruments showing there. And with that, I already like to hand over to Kai and Adrian. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Frank, for the kind introduction and also a very warm welcome from my side. My name is Adrian Fiege and today here with me is Kai Behrens. Yeah, also welcome from my side. And yeah, Adrian, tell us what we will learn today. So in this first session, we will talk about uh, cosmetic applications from raw material to the store. And first of all, let's have a closer look at what um, elemental analysis is used for in uh, cosmetic production, cosmetic industry. So here you want to use elemental analysis, for instance, to reduce your cost of your, your production, but also at the same time ensure high quality cosmetics and personal care products at all uh, times. And this includes, for instance, measuring, of course, heavy uh, metals concentrations and keeping them below the regulated limits. So some of the examples that uh, are done where elemental analysis is needed in, X, uh, in cosmetics include the raw material verification, uh, such as color additives, and here especially the heavy elements such mm -hmm. as arsenic and, and lead. And then monitoring the processes. Here we start to look also into active ingredients, which could include zinc and titanium oxide. So we'll talk about this a little bit in this uh, seminar. And then, of course, we look into the uh, final product. But there's also another level. So when you think about uh, customs and governmental institutions who need to make sure that there are no fake products on the market or products with substances inside that are um, toxic for, for you or your skin, like uh, uh, elevated mercury, uh, skin brightener, this is also a task where elemental analysis can help. So traditionally, um, elemental analysis in cosmetics, but also in pharmaceuticals, is done by two types of technologies. So they are uh, atomic absorption spectrometry or inductively coupled plasma spectrometry, ICP or ICP OES or MS, for example. Here you have a spectroscopic uh, method that can cover a wide range of elements. Um, and has been established over the relatively long time. However, the samples need to be treated before you can measure them. So you need to dilute the samples, typically dissolve the samples first, and then you need to uh, calibrate the instrument daily. So there's a lot of work involved before you actually can get your first result. Mm -hmm. Especially what is very important uh, in uh, all those calibration, the instrument warm-up requires a lot of time and also expertise. means uh, this uh, ends up in a huge uh, cost of ownership at the end. Yeah, exactly. So maybe Kai, you can tell us a bit more what, what we can do with XRF here instead. Yeah, XRF basically works a little bit different uh, like the other two methods. Uh, the one thing is uh, that we are exciting an inner electron. So the X-ray photon hits the inner electron and the electron is expelled. So now actually an electron from an outer shell falls uh, close to the, uh, or to the lower shell and actually releases the excess of energy as another uh, X-ray photon with a certain energy. 
So on the, on the one hand, this means we are independent of the bounding because we work with inner uh, electrons. And the second thing is uh, that our spectrum are not very complicated, so we can easily identify the elements which are excited. Mm -hmm. So, and, and uh, therefore, those instruments can detect very sensitive and independent of the sample shape and form and, and, and uh, uh, if this is a liquid or a solid, we can really easily detect the element. Yeah, Kai, that sounds really uh, straightforward. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about which elements can be measured and also uh, what concentration ranges we are dealing with. Yeah. So actually you see here the periodic table and uh, we actually see the, the blue uh, colored elements. Those are the elements which can be analyzed by every single technology. There are actually two technologies available. The one is the energy dispersive XOF, that's typically benchtop instruments. And those uh, are instruments are working with an energy dispersive detector. It's a semiconductor detector. And this has an entrance window. So typically we start with elements from sodium. There are special versions like our S2 Puma with a high sense XE. So it can uh, see carbon and then detect also in uh, elements of interest like fluorine, which we will see later. Mm -hmm. A higher resolution and a higher detection power is provided by the wavelength dispersive XOF. So there we can work down in solids to beryllium. Mm -hmm. And so the typical concentration range is somehow the sub-PPM level up to 100%. So we can imagine that it's, it's pretty good when we analyze raw materials, mm -hmm. which consist of maybe 50% titanium. And at the same time, we want to detect uh, traces of titanium in other products. So uh, it's, it's a pretty nice, huge calibration range. And this can be done on the same sample, so the Ex traces. And, exactly, yeah. exactly. So what about sample preparation? Is there anything specific that we need to worry about or care about? Um. The very big difference between uh, XOF and other methods is that we are working with the sample directly. Mm -hmm. So we do not need any digestion, any dilution, uh, and actually we can use those liquid cups um, and fill in the sample directly. As a loose powder, when we think of uh, coloring additives, we can uh, fill in lotions or toothpaste uh, but also directly analyze uh, tablets or the liquid itself. So therefore, sample preparation is quite minimal and, and doesn't require a lot of training. So that's, and, and on the other hand, there is a big selection of atmospheric modes available to ensure that we always work under the best conditions. So solid samples like tablets can be analyzed under vacuum. For uh, liquids, of course, we would work under helium atmosphere mm -hmm to uh, provide the uh, transmission of the very light X-rays. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when we just are, are interested in uh, very heavy elements, we can work under air. And, and that's a very um, uh, cost-saving uh, air, air mode. And our instruments typically come with a vacuum pump, so therefore, yeah, cost of operation is pretty limited. Yeah, and actually Renata will later on show us uh, how simple it is to, to measure a sample in such a cup. So you, you already mentioned it a bit, so cost of ownership, we heard a few words about that, that this is one of the strengths maybe of XRF. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, basically we, we uh, thought, okay, uh, ICPAS, we need to digest the sample. So this starts with uh, lab equipment, we need a fume hood, uh, we need training of personnel to uh, handle uh, hazardous uh, substances like acids. Uh, we need educated staff who can dilute uh, one to thousand working with pipettes. It's a very uh, uh, labor intensive work. Some of the methods will have a high consumption of noble gases like mm -hmm. ICP. So whenever you start an ICP, you require an uh, argon gas supply all the time. AAS would require graphite tubes. Um, you are investing heavily in uh, standards because every time you are running a sample, you also require standards um, like an AAS standard edition. So at the end, uh, it's not only the instrument itself, but also the running cost and the cost for personnel is pretty high, labor intensive. Yeah. 
When we compare the uh, uh, XOF instruments, the sample preparation, we have almost no gas or very little gas consumption. Um, typically, it's not labor intensive, the sample preparation, and uh, in, let's say a normal skilled uh, worker can do the sample preparation thing. And we don't have any hazardous consumables uh, uh, required. Mm. So this is actually a great deal when we think about uh, operating cost. Yeah. Yeah, coming back basically to the point I made at the very beginning, that besides making sure that we have the high quality, this is really a tool that helps us uh, yeah. to save costs here at, at different levels. Exactly, and we will see, uh, actually it's also time saving. Uh, mm -hmm. In the next example, we can use those, uh, those cups, sorry, we can use those cups and fill the toothpaste directly in. Yeah. Means no dilution, no digestion. Yeah, and within minutes we have the result. So maybe we get started now with, with some uh, application examples. And the first one uh, we brought here for you is um, a very obvious task for XRF, and this is uh, raw material identification. And uh, why is this obvious? Because uh, when, especially when we use now an energy dispersive system, we have the advantage that we get a spectra of the entire sample. So this, this spectra then tells us what's inside in, in within a few minutes. And there are so-called fundamental parameters which help us to essentially model the spectra and therefore know what's inside. So this can, means that we can actually detect, identify a sample and detect the elements inside and even quantify them um, to a certain extent uh, with the push of a button and with very minimal information about the sample. Yeah, I mean, uh, I really like this feature without having any calibration. Whenever you get something in the lab, it uh, could be also a sample from a shop, from, mm -hmm. from a, comp a competitor of yours. Actually, you simply put it inside and immediately you know if they are using some kind of silicon or in, uh, how are they in, uh, using to, to, to uh, bring up the brightness, titanium dioxide, you will see immediately and, and without doing any calibration. So Exactly. So, and the first example I brought here uh, to you, and this is actually something uh, Renata will also show you later on how, how to measure such samples, is um, here we measured simply a, a shampoo from the store, a hand lotion and a hand gel uh, in re green, blue and red color. And uh, with our standard less solution, SmartQuant, on our S2 Puma energy dispersive system, and you can see clearly that, that we, we have differences. For instance, on the side of Kai, you see the sodium uh, peak. There's a significant amount of sodium in the shampoo, a little bit in, in the hand lotion, and essentially nothing in uh, the hand gel. So, and uh, this was a not calibrated method. But you can push it even a little bit further by uh, uh, quantifying the concentrations here. So because the peak at first doesn't, doesn't tell you much, but the, the algorithm inside can give you uh, a quite robust um, uh, quantification of the concentrations of, of the uh, different elements. And yeah, you can see, for instance, in, in, uh, in the shampoo, you have quite some sodium, as we've seen. The sodium content, in this case, for, for the hand lotion, where we saw mm -hmm. some sodium, is already a little bit below the detection limit for such a standardless method. Of course, you could detect that with a calibrated method, but um, not with a, a standardless method. Another mm -hmm. example here on my right-hand side, silicon peak. We see that there's a little bit of silicon in, in that, uh, uh, in that uh, shampoo, and uh, that essentially is, of course, detectable with a, the with a system and even quantifiable, but here's a little bit the limitation of a, of a standardless solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually uh, this is uh, the, the big power. We can uh, have a quick result, a quick overview with the standardless method. And then for dedicated applications with one-time calibration, we get a very detailed, accurate, precise look. Exactly. And I think this is something where, where Kai now wants to tell us a bit more. So uh, let's think about um, active ingredients, for instance, in wound ointment and yeah. uh, sun lotion. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, whenever it comes to active ingredients, uh, then actually we uh, need to know uh, what is really inside. Not only the element or the compound, but also the concentration. Because actually we have developed this product and uh, the development tells us, okay, this is something should be with a sun blocker uh, up to uh, state 30. 
And then this requires this amount of zinc oxide or titanium oxide. So and here we actually run a full scan and so we can evaluate uh, if zinc and titanium is present or not and rapidly without uh, anything. So um, we can monitor products on the market. This is important for uh, regulating authorities uh, when they do a market survey, but also when you do uh, production control and uh, you are getting uh, chemicals from different sources, immediately you can screen and scan uh, and see if the ID of uh, the sample uh, actually fits, right? Yeah. So maybe uh, you can tell us a bit more about well, what it means then in terms of precision and accuracy when we actually calibrate here. Yeah. Basically, we get a kind of semi-quantitative uh, result when we run our standardless software. Nevertheless, when we do quality control or final product inspection, we would have a calibration. So we calibrate the instrument one time in the beginning, and actually then we get very precise result. So here we see that uh, this product has titanium dioxide in the range of 9.5%, uh, and then about 1.9% uh, zinc oxide. And so uh, the precision here is below 1% relative, and, and this is pretty good because we can precisely dose those chemicals, verify that the concentrations are fit to our product development, and uh, so we can release those products as long as they fit to the specification. Mm -hmm. and the very good thing, XRF instruments are very stable, so we just need a one-time calibration uh, when we set up the application, and uh, then we simply can run and operate the instrument. Yeah. And precise measurement also means that you can dose it correctly, so you can spare expensive additives, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So another example that we want to explain you today on, on a use case of, um, of XRF in, in cosmetics is toothpaste. We, and here we start a bit with, with fluorine. In toothpaste. We all know why fluorine is, is added in, into uh, our toothpaste, and, but we also know that, for instance, it is uh, because our uh, youngest can't spit out the, the toothpaste, they get a little less in, in the toothpaste. Um, so the, we took just a couple of them from the store, one for the really young children with just 500 ppm of fluorine, one for the intermediate younger children, and then also uh, some for adults and even one of those high, rich uh, fluorine gels, which have up to, uh, in this case, 1.23% uh, of fluorine inside. Um, and as Kai mentioned, fluorine is a task where um, normal energy dispersive systems would uh, come to their limits. But here we have the ST Puma, which is equipped with our latest and greatest detector, so the Hisense XP detector with a, a graphene window. And there we can also detect fluorine quite precisely. So here we, we did a, a repetition test with the 500 ppm sample. You can see the results here on my right-hand side. So we really almost mm -hmm. nailed the uh, uh, known composition, um, which was basically the value on the packaging, and have also very high precision even for such a uh, light element. Yeah. In this case, maybe one, one comment on the preparation. When you deal with fluorine, you can't use uh, uh, such a cup with a foil. So in this case, we would dry the sample. So once you have anything above sodium, magnesium, and so on, chlorine, etc., you would use a, a cup like uh, Kai has with a thin foil at the bottom. You can simply pure it into the cup. Uh, if you really defuel fluorine, you want to get rid of that foil, but you simply dry the sample and get a nice, uh, um, even mm -hmm. sample there. Yeah, you actually see also the power of the instrument with a limit of uh, detection uh, for this uh, measurement time of 50 ppm. So we are far away from uh, the, the uh, interesting element range. So, um, yeah, so the 500 or when we think about a product with uh, specified high 1% fluorine, mm -hmm. we can make sure that those fluorine is all, also inside the product. Yeah, exactly. But we also wanted to have a deeper look into um, uh, our different toothpaste. And since we didn't have, of course, the, the, the reference values for the different ingredients, we made here once again a, a, a smart quant, so a standardless approach. Maybe a little bit of background. If you look at the back of your toothpaste, you can see that there's very different ingredients. And from one to the other, it can differ quite a bit. 
Most all of them have hydrated silica inside. It's basically you, the abrasive, uh, uh, which helps a lot with cleaning. But then the rest can differ quite a bit, and also the fluorine content, uh, of course. Um, so in this case, we did a smart quant measurement on the dried samples. But as I mentioned, we can also still uh, pure them inside uh, in a liquid cup, and then was, would, of course, have more the, uh, the relative proportion of the actual toothpaste with the water inside. So, and uh, these are the results here just for, for two examples here on my right hand side for the adult uh, toothpaste and, and the, the kid's toothpaste. I don't want to go too much into detail, but we can see clearly that there's a difference in, in the amount of abrasive, in this case, mostly hydrated silica, so we can distinguish between those. But another uh, nice or interesting observation, I should probably say, is uh, that we see um, in, in three of the uh, uh, five products, uh, no titanium oxide, and then we see it in two of them, it's present. In the adult toothpaste, it's present, it's also stated. Um, it's used as a brightener there and makes the toothpaste nice and, and bright and white and shiny. In the kids' toothpaste, however, we also see some substantial amount of titanium oxide. It's not mentioned, and this I would interpret as a little bit of a marketing uh, pitch here, if you want. So because currently there's a bit of ongoing discussion about how toxic uh, titanium oxide might be in terms of nanoparticle, et cetera. But this also tells you that we can, with this tool, really nicely detect titanium oxide. So if there comes up a regulation for, let's say, titanium oxide and toothpaste, this equipment would make you ready for this type of analysis. Yeah. What is important to uh, notice, of course, XOF, but also the other method, can't detect the compound. We are analyzing the elements. And what is important here means actually we are analyzing the titanium and then calculate back to titanium oxide, which is used, or the hydrated silica, uh, which is then um, actually uh, can be also converted into the original content, not only the element, but also the oxide, right? Yeah. Exactly. Important comment here. So now we have also another topic, and maybe Kai, you can tell us a bit more about this one. So what is about color additives? I mentioned that at the beginning that heavy metals here is a topic. Yeah. Whenever elements are in active ingredients, of course, uh, then we know we want to have this element in the product. Nevertheless, there are unwanted elements or regulated elements because of their toxicity. And actually, for example, the United States, they have the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR, and the Title 21. There's also the Part 73. And so there are a list of uh, color additives. And uh, they basically have uh, a regulation for cosmetics. And they limit, for example, bismuth nitrate or, or arsenic or lead or mercury and in different color additives like iron oxide or silver nitrate. And the same happens to be in, in, in part 74, where we uh, talk about black uh, color additives in cosmetics. So actually, those are uh, regulations for dedicated products. And when you have such kind of product or raw material, you want to control it. You need to control it to specify that you are not out of spec and you follow the law, right? Yeah. Yeah. And even if you just purchase these, you might want to check occasionally whether you get the good material before you put it into your products. Exactly. Yeah. So actually here, that's one of the things um, our customer bought titanium dioxide to be put into, into their, their products, sunblocker cream, but also skincare products. And actually, the heavy metal content is regulated. We are looking here at arsenic in the range of 26 ppm and lead also 26 ppm. We see that the detection limit of this method is in the range of 1 ppm, so far below what is required. And we see that even with a repetition test, we can uh, very clearly see with a standard deviation of 0 0.5 ppm that uh, we can control the limit values. So actually, whenever you have the incoming inspection of the color additive or brightener, Actually, you can do it by IXOF. That's an easy job. Uh, we fulfill the requirements and make sure that uh, the uh, raw material you have bought really fits to the uh, later use. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you, Kai. So maybe just one last mention here. So these samples, the titanium oxide, 
In this case, you could measure them in such a cup, but you can also press them, which uh, gets a nice palette and it's just also taking a few minutes to prepare. I think this is all what we wanted to present for the first part. So now I would like to hand over to Renata and she will actually show us the S2 Puma, how to use it and some tips and tricks. So thank you for the first part and over to you, Renata. Hello, welcome back to the lab. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Kai. My name is Renata Janic, and today I would like to introduce you the S2 Puma, and I would like to tell you something about application in cosmetics. This system here is equipped with a XY table. So we have a loader area here for the samples. The grabber will pick up the sample and will load it into the measurement chamber. While the measurement is running, you can easily load and unload new samples. This system here is equipped with a high sense XP detector. The detector is designed to increase especially light elements. Here in this case, we have already analyzed some tools past I would like to show you. So Adrian already presented the data for the analysis of fluorine in toothpaste. But the system can also be used for other kinds of material, like for example, sun cream, different creams or shampoo. So the preparation is quite easy in XRF for these kind of materials. This is something I would like to show you now. For this application, we typically use a liquid cup. So this is a liquid cup, which is just easily mounted manually. And we have this um, uh, foil, which is used. I have already prepared a liquid cup, so it just looks like this. The material is filled in and the liquid cup is closed with a lid, and so the measurement can start. Here I have some shampoo. I would like to show you how easy the preparation for XRF is. So I just put in the liquid cup into the sample holder, put in some material. I close the cup and that's it. The sample is already prepared and can be measured. Okay, let's start. I will just start a measurement, so a so-called standardless method. It's called Smart Quant FP. It's very easy to start the measurement from the touch screen. So I just select the sample position. The method is selected with the buttons here on the screen. You can type in the sample name, but it's also possible to uh, edit some more sample information. To start the measurement, I just push the green button. Now you can see the grabber is moving, is picking up the sample, and we load it into the sample measurement chamber. While the measurement is running, I would like to show you a little bit how spectra are analyzed, how you can have a look, how you can easily compare different kind of materials. So let's start. So here on the screen, this is our software. It's called Spectra Elements. Now we can see the sample which we already started. It's running. All the sample properties are shown here and the screen is showing the same like on the touch screen. But now I would like to show you some spectra. I have already analyzed some material. Here in this case, I analyzed two different hand creams and shampoo, the one which I have already prepared now. So typically the software, um, the standardless method uses different ranges, but I would like to focus in the range of the light elements where we can see differences in the sample. So if I zoom in here, So what we can see here, so the software will tell you which element is shown here. So here we can see the sulfur peak. We can easily see that there are differences in the three samples. So the green sample, this is the shampoo sample, and the green, uh, sorry, and the blue and the red spectra, this is the hand cream. The same for chlorine, so we can see that in the shampoo, the chlorine peak is much higher. So here we can easily compare um, different kind of samples, materials, and we can have a qualitative check of the spectra. 
to show you another example. In this window, uh, we do have the four, uh, we, uh, sorry, five different uh, toothpaste we have analyzed. Again, I will zoom in a little bit so we can easily see differences, for example, here in the sodium intensity for the five different samples. I will just zoom back to another element range. For example, here, you can also see that there is a big difference in silicon intensity. The same for phosphorus. So we have two samples with quite high phosphorus intensity and three samples with more or less no phosphorus. We can have a closer look on sulfur and on chloride. So you see it's very easy to make a qualitative check of the spectra. There is another element which is maybe quite interesting. So if I zoom in here, so again, the software will show you which element is presented here. So it's titanium. So titanium dioxide is a quite common uh, ingredient for cosmetics. In this case, we see that two samples have quite high titanium intensity and three samples doesn't have any uh, titanium uh, inside. It's quite interesting. So for one of the samples, it was also written on the tube that there is titanium dioxide inside. And for the other sample, it was even not written on the tube. So it was quite surprising to see titanium inside. This can also be used to set limits. For example, if you would like to highlight samples with a dedicated concentration on titanium, you can set specifications to the software. And then these samples will be highlighted, for example, with a color code if this titanium concentration is higher than the specification or not. So this is just to show you a little bit how the software looks like and how easy it is to compare spectra. And of course, the standardless software will also run a quantitative analysis to calculate results. So that's all for the first session. So thanks a lot. And let's go back to the studio to Kai and Adrian. Yeah, thank you, Renata, for the first uh, lab view. And uh, now go to the second part, Adrian. Yeah, in the second part, we want to talk about use cases uh, in pharmaceuticals, so some application examples. And here, elemental analysis is also required in all manufacturing steps. But even more than in cosmetics, of course, everything is very strictly regulated. Two examples where XRF is really suitable is uh, especially for the raw material verification, and we'll show you some examples there. And then also for uh, catalyst residuals. So in the drug manufacturing process, we can measure these catalyst residuals, for instance, palladium, um, in, in our materials and ensure that they don't make their way into the final uh, product. Yeah. The big difference here is that uh, a lot of pharmaceuticals are swallowed. So basically, it's not just a skin uh, product, but also uh, there's oral intake, and then of course it may must yeah it, it's it's important to monitor the toxic elements, right? Exactly, yeah. So when working in the uh, pharmaceutical industry and when having analytical uh, equipment there and storing data, for instance, then you need to comply with the regulations in Title Twenty One CFR Part Eleven. So this basically defines uh, how the criteria which need to be met so that electronic data uh, is as valid as uh, um, written signatures, paper records. And so, for instance, you need a very robust uh, database. You need certain ways to uh, enable auditing. You need an audit trailing that cannot be tampered with. And with our uh, software, so Spectra Elements, we have all these features ready for our instruments like the S2 Puma here. And we also smoothly implemented them, so it makes, it, makes the life of um, the operator and the life also of the lab manager when an audit is up to come uh, really easy. So, of course, we have electronic signatures, validation process. We can use different user levels in terms of who is allowed to do what. And so our instruments are really ready for this environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So actually, data manipulation can be excluded. So... Uh, this is the most important one, and we actually uh, guide the customer through standard operating procedures so that it uh, typically doesn't, uh, isn't possible to deviate from this normal route. Exactly. 
Another topic that is often uh, 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 important when uh, getting new equipment is you need to go through the processes of installation qualification, operation qualification, and later on also performance qualification. Especially with the first two steps, so installation and operation qualification, we can help you. So we have our, our dedicated instruments here, the S2 Puma and the S6 Jaguar. We have detailed documentation uh, that helps you to, uh, guides you through the process. You can then store it, have it ready for, for an audit, etc. And we have also, of course, all of our staff is Part 11 trained, so our service technicians are Part 11 trained, our application specialists are Part 11 trained, so they can help you with that documentation once your system arrives, and this really helps you to get started without too much effort. Yeah. Exactly. So this is uh, where we can support you directly in getting the instrument uh, integrated into your process. And now uh, I think we want to start looking into some examples. And the first example, maybe Kai, I would like ask you to tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about raw materials uh, in, in pharmaceuticals. Yeah. yeah. means uh, whenever we are entering a pharmaceutical plant, it looks more or less like a big chemical plant. And there is a lot of chemicals coming in to the warehouse. And when you look at them, it's not easy to tell the difference. We, we see that sodium chloride, potassium chloride almost looks the same. If you mix them up, it can be very severe for, for your uh, customers. And also other like calcium chlorine, magnesium sulfate, aluminium phosphate. Um, so actually you need to ensure that uh, this salt is really what it looks like and what it's declared. Mm -hmm. And that you don't mix up those salts before you are, for example, manufacture infusions or use aluminium phosphate for vaccination uh, products or calcium carbonate for dietary uh, products or supplements. So, and here uh, we already learned with the cosmetics that uh, XRF has a kind of monitoring mode and quickly can show an entire spectrum which helps to identify the elements present. And this is what we see here. Actually, it's very easy with our touch control software uh, for operators in the warehouse that uh, they load a sample on the tray, they see in, uh, immediately the one position, and then there is one button with, uh, for example, named uh, sample ID or chemical ID. You press the button, that's it, the sample is loaded, and then we actually record a spectrum. And uh, we will see here the first example. So there are two salts, and you can see the one salt contains uh, sodium, the red salt contains potassium, and that's easy to separate the two chlorine uh, samples. So actually, we can make sure with just uh, a few seconds measurement time, we can make sure that we don't mix up those two bags, right? Uh, here you see uh, the spectra of uh, the four phosphate carbonated uh, sulfates, and you easily can see that we clearly can identify quickly. Does the operator need to be an expert and look at spectra? No, that's not the case. Our software is already set up that uh, you can see here with the uh, uh, green check mark or the, the red uh, X uh, that this is rejected or accepted. And so therefore it's easy for operators to quickly get a, get a result and release uh, the, the shipment for further processing. Yeah, and here you have really the option, all the flexibility you need. So you can either just display um, whether it's within limit, so you just have a red or, or green light, essentially, or you can also, as shown here in this example, uh, show some uh, um, standardless results if you want to look in some more detail. This really depends also on your uh, standard operation procedures, what needs to be done. And then, like Kai said, you also have the option of doing this all on a, on a PC next to the instrument with a minimized view um, for suitable for an operator or even on a touch screen yeah. if that's uh, uh, suitable for yeah. you. Yeah. So this was already one of the questions uh, we get in advance. Uh, can this instrument be put into a warehouse? And obviously, yes, it's, it's uh, simple to operate. It's uh, not confusing with the interface and even the uh, evaluation. Uh, goes pretty pretty smart means even my my youngest son can easily work here <laughs> and it's also pretty sturdy because you must imagine we also put this into the heavy industry at steel manufacturing plants and uh, 
a cement plant, so this can stand there and will not get damaged. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe a few more words here then about um, really the time to result, because when we're talking about warehouse, we really need to have the answer quickly. Uh, we might want to want to check off the box that this this shipment is fine before it goes to the next step in, into the production process. And like I said, one of uh, the big advantages is that we, uh, with XRF compared to ICP or AES, is that we don't have to digest the sample and we don't have to recalibrate. And at the end of the day, this really pays back. This pays back in higher throughput. And especially uh, for raw material, it pays back in having within minutes the answer to the question, which can be as simple as differentiating between two different chlorine uh, uh, salts. The other, the other point here is also when you're coming to the production process, when you're monitoring your, your production process, there you also want a relatively quick answer if something is wrong or something is out of the normal, because that can, can save you uh, a lot of money in, in later on in the, in the process. And then sampling this material and digesting it first um, before you get the answer is, means a lot of um, time until which you, where you could get the result already on an XRF system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so actually, in, uh, it's, it's a great deal of money. It's a great deal of time uh, switching for every application where this fits uh, from AS ICP to XRF, right? Exactly. So within this uh, presentation, also uh, in the first uh, lab session, we, we talked a lot about energy dispersive systems. So in some cases, however, especially when, when you want to go to some lower trace elements, also especially for lighter elements, you need uh, another technology. And Kai mentioned that at the beginning, but there's another technology which is called wavelength dispersive systems. And here we have a benchtop equipment, the S6 Jaguar, which is also available with Part 11 compliant software. And as you can see in, in this very simple graph here, we can nicely separate signals, and this will, of course, help us to get better performance. And maybe, Kai, you can tell us a bit more about where, how do we get there? Yeah, so the uh, first uh, difference between a wavelength dispersive and an energy dispersive instrument is the power. Actually, we see that uh, those EDX instruments typically operate with 50 watt, and here we already have 400 watt, the bigger floor standing units going up to one or uh, up to four kilowatt even. And then actually we have here a closer look inside and uh, you would recognize that the sample sits on top there is, uh, of the X-ray tube. The X-ray tube is on the left hand side. And then actually the uh, X-ray fluorescence radiation enters the goniometer. And the goniometer is the trick because there are analyzer crystals, a set of analyzer crystals for particular element ranges, and a set of two detectors. Mm -hmm. And we simply work like a prisma, so they split off the uh, radiation according to their energy in different angles. And then we travel with the detector to this position. And because we are using the wavelength dispersive uh, crystal, actually we can achieve the very high resolution and still maintain the sensitivity because we have the higher power. And so this helps to, to even uh, uh, separate smaller peaks, neighboring peaks from, from major elements and uh, get a more detailed look on our, uh, on our samples. Mm -hmm. And this is actually what uh, customers are using in pharmaceutical uh, factories. Uh, so we have the S6 Jaguar installed in one of the customer side, and this is basically uh, his statement. So the fast analysis of our drug substances and intermediates of our sunscreen product is vital for us. So they are telling, okay, we are doing this fast, we are saving a lot of money because we get a quick answer. The S6 Jaguar is much more sensitive than comparable spectrometers, and the ease of use and the CFR Part uh, 11 readiness and the compliance there of spectral elements is important. So on the one hand, the data are pretty good, it's fast, and on the other hand, it's very easy to implement into a pharmaceutical process. Mm -hmm. So their decision criteria was better light element performance, better resolution, which helps more to separate neighboring elements, and the CFR Part 11 compliance of our software, including the IQOQ. Okay, so one more topic we want to cover here is also uh, into the, the guideline for really 
the heavy elements. So Kai mentioned that at the beginning, when you uh, are going into drug manufacturing, it's different than putting uh, a lotion on your skin because you have oral intake. And therefore, especially for elements like cadmium, lead, arsenic, but also uh, mercury and so on, there are relatively tight limits which need to be uh, uh, kept um, for oral intake. And then there's also inhalation, which is much more strict and parental intake. So a couple of years ago, this has been uh, implemented by, uh, by the International Conference of Harmonization, so basically defined. And there is a list of 24 elements split, split into different groups. Some of them are must meet, some of them depending on where, where, uh, where you're at in the manufacturing process. And typically, this is a, a, a task that is, uh, is currently being done by ICP MS for the most, uh, most part. Um, there are also guidelines on uh, which uh, technology to use. So the, the guidelines on the concentration levels, on the impurities of heavy metals, that is in the US Pharmacopeia chapter 232. And then uh, shortly after that, or with that together, essentially, um, the ICPMS and ICPOES were defined as technologies for this type of application, so very heavy, heavy metal impurities at, at low limits. And then later on, in 2015, I believe, uh, the USP 735 was added, and that now also uh, enables the use of X-ray fluorescence for the analysis um, of, of samples that are uh, dealt with in um, pharmaceutical manufacturing and uh, also with these very low concentration ranges. And this is basically enforced by the US uh, Food and Drug Administration. However, uh, everybody who wants to uh, essentially sell their, their, their drugs and put it to the yes market have to also oblige. So, and there's a, um, a partner agreement for the European Union, also the Annex 11. So essentially, this is applicable, applicable globally. If you look a little bit into what, what we can do with our systems, this is an example here for the smaller one, so the S2 Puma. Um, here we've measured some, some samples, uh, cellulose samples essentially, and we can see that for these class 1 and class 2A uh, elements, we can get uh, detection limits on the order of 1 to 2 uh, ppm, so it depends a bit, but we can get very low and uh, get these, uh, measure these impurities. And here are some examples, for instance, for cobalt, we even get in the sub-PPM level, and that just was an energy dispersive system. Mm -hmm. So with that, I think we are already <coughs> at the end of our uh, second presentation, or near the end. I would last ask maybe Kai to sum up uh, some of the facts about our instrumentation. Yeah, it means actually when we, when we have a closer look to our instruments, they share uh, state-of-the-art software and hardware. It means we have learned uh, that the powerful X-ray tubes are providing high sensitivity to see even traces of heavy toxic elements. We see that the high sense technology, the kind of uh, detectors we are using are enabling instruments to detect even light elements or neighboring elements. And the sample care technology uh, basically helps us to, uh, to, to run different samples in a safe way. The software spectra.elements is already uh, um, prepared for the use in the pharmaceutical environment and therefore, of course, naturally also for cosmetics. So, yeah, we have different sample loader types depending on the requirements. So, whatever you want to analyze, paste, uh, liquids, uh, powders, uh, dried samples, yeah, the sample magazines can handle those. And uh, to feature a few highlights, it's the light element configuration of our benchtop instruments, especially the different uh, modes to analyze the sample. The liquids may be under air or uh, maybe under helium atmosphere. And since we have vacuum, the solid samples can be analyzed always under vacuum. And um, we have learned that one of the major features is the smart quant, the standardless software, which is a great deal, especially when identifying substances or making sure that the substance is delivered according to spec. And last but not least, again, the 21 CFR Part 11 software. This is a great deal, which helps you to implement the instrument quickly. Yeah. 
Yeah. So Kai, overall, we can really tailor make our spectrometers to uh, our customers' needs. Some of the features are prerequisite, such as the Part 11 compliant software in, in Pharma. Some are needed for the analytical performance, and others are really for, um, for the operations, so for the ease of use. Um, so we really have a, a something for everything here. And I think with that, we can hand over to Renata, who will show us uh, um, now the S6 Jaguar live in action and give us a few more ideas about that instrument. Hello, welcome back to the lab. In the next session, I would like to show you the S6 Jaguar, our wavelength dispersive tabletop system. So when wavelength dispersive is used, so typically when higher resolution is required compared to an energy dispersive system or a higher intensity or sensitivity is required for especially light elements. Now I would like to show you the system a little bit more detail. So let's have a look inside. So here we have the sample loader area, so the XY loader area with the grabber. So the grabber picks up the samples and transfers it to the measurement position. And while the measurement is running, you can easily load and unload the samples. This system is also available with the easy loader cups like already shown on the S2 Puma. Here we use another configuration. This is a two-part cup. So here we have the measurement um, area. So in these cups, you can have samples up to five centimeter diameter, but also smaller samples can be handled. In this case, the only thing we have to do to replace the lower part of the cup. The system can analyze powder samples. For example, I have some talcum powder here. This can be prepared in a liquid cup, like already shown on the S2 Puma. You can also analyze cellulose samples prepared um, as powder in a liquid cup, or you can prepare pressed pellets and, for example, analyze uh, uh, traces in titanium dioxide. Now I would like to show you some components, what's inside. So first of all, the joniometer chamber is protected. So we use this uh, sample seal. So this is a grid with a very, very thin foil to protect the goniometer chamber from drops or from dust. Another part is the collimator. So this is a collimator. These effects are just very thin copper plates which are mounted to get a parallel beam on the crystal. To separate the wavelengths on the crystal, we have different crystals which are used. So here, this is a natural lithium fluorine crystal. And here we have a sputtered germanium crystal, which is used mainly for phosphorus and sulfur analysis. And this is very long time stable compared to a used PT crystal. In this system, we can mount up to four different crystals. Then at the end, the intensity is detected. So here, this is a common scintillation counter, which is typically used in wavelength dispersive XRF analysis. So here in our S6 Jaguar, we use a different um, counter, which has a very good linearity up to 2 million counts per seconds. As you can see here, so we also have the possibility to have a touch control integrated, so you can operate the system with a touch screen, but of course you can also use an external PC to start measurements to do evaluations. Spectra Elements, which is used for the S2 Puma and the S6 Jaguar, is fully compliant with part 11 requirements, like for example, audit trail, different user levels. That's all from me today, so thanks a lot. And let's go back to the studio. Yeah, thank you very much, Renata. And with this, I would like to briefly summarizing the seminar. For the cosmetic industry, it has been shown that XRF is an excellent tool for the raw material identification for the production monitoring and final product quality control. We have shown that uh, the
quantification of active ingredients is possible in cosmetics and personal care products. Furthermore, XRF is ensuring the compliance with 21 CFR 73C and 743 for the heavy metal contaminants analysis in color additives such as arsenic, mercury, and lead. And furthermore, XRF is supporting the governmental institutions and customs to ensure consumer safety by detecting forbidden use of mercury as skin brightener, for example. In the pharmaceutical industry, in Chapter 735 of the United States Pharmacopoeia, XRF has been introduced as a technology for elemental analysis. Furthermore, XRF is an excellent tool for rapid and reliable raw material verification. And it supports ICPMS by enabling fast headline screening, for example, of catalyst residues in the drug manufacturing process. XRF spectrometers from Burger are available with 21 CFR Part 11 compliant software, and we as well provide the required IQOQ documentation for the process. And with this, I would like to hand over to the question and answer session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we received already quite a number of um, good questions and also with the registration of the seminar, we received a number of them. So we will have an, a mixture of, of those and the ones which came in just in this session. So just let me start. Um, for XF, um, one of the topics is um, how to measure low levels of heavy metals um, and um, in cosmetics, for example, at various concentration levels. And how about the accuracy for these lower levels? Um, can one of you answer this, this question? Yeah, the, 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 the big advantage we have uh, with the heavy metals is that the uh, fluorescence radiation is quite uh, powerful. So therefore, we, we get uh, uh, the, the signal from a very large volume of the sample. So therefore, the sensitivity is pretty good. So, and um, this per performance is uh, down to a level of 0 0.x ppm. And uh, the accuracy is pretty good because we have very little in uh, influencing uh, factors there. There is maybe one of the elements, the weakest element, is maybe uh, mercury a little bit, which uh, shows some higher LODs, and uh, maybe also cadmium. It, it's not as good as uh, elements like arsenic, uh, lead, but the accuracy and precision is, is very good. Um, yeah, yeah, it's in the in the sub ppm range, and that's basically applicable uh, for both the S six Jaguar and uh, the S two Puma. Um, important there is, is also um, that, for example, in this case, um, critical is that you have a very good calibration. So you can use secondary references from ICPMS, and then you have a good calibration also down to the PPM and sub PPM level there. Yeah. Perfect. There was a question related to um, SmartQuant um, uh, FP, the, the standardless method, and how about this uncertainty uh, for, those for this method, and how about um, the amount of sample you need for these type of measurements? Yeah, the amount of sample, uh, first of all, um, it depends a bit. You can get away sometimes with a few grams. Often uh, we, we would like to have something like 5 uh, to 10 gram if, if possible. Um, the smaller you get with the amount, the smaller uh, maybe you can, the area you can analyze also gets the less signal you get. Um, regarding the um, precision accuracy, um, well, let's phrase it a bit um, differently. So the, the standardless uh, methods are mostly used for uh, minor and major elements, so mostly in the, in the percentage and uh, lower and higher thousands of ppm range. Once you get to the um, PPM range, uh, like less than 1,000, less than 500, this is when you typically uh, need a, a calibration. 
You can still get an informative value there for, for such uh, concentration levels, but uh, uh, it wouldn't be a, a high-level quantification. Yeah. I would say uh, let's, uh, let's uh, go to a, to a 5% uh, or better relative uh, the standard deviation when you talk about the higher concentrations. It's in the range of 10% uh, or, or better when you go to lower. Mm -hmm. The good thing is that the smart quant or the standardless packages are also capable uh, and, and you can provide sample information, which means a diameter, a mass, and uh, we also have the sample mask available in the instrument. And this helps to maintain the uh, accuracy and precision in the moment you have very small amounts of samples. So uh, when you want to really yeah, get it uh, to the limit, uh, something like 500 um, uh, milligrams uh, uh, would still be uh, possible to, to, to get a decent result. Yeah. There are quite a number of questions relating to the calibration, so maybe just uh, hear one more. Um, a user has to quantify heavy metals in powder samples, and um, is it possible to use reference materials in liquid form for such calibrations? Yeah, I mean, if you you can use uh, liquids and and solids and powders in in the instrument, but normally what what you would use you would use the same kind of uh, a matrix or let's say state physical state uh, for a calibration uh, that you also do use during measurement. So if you do want to have a high precision and accuracy calibration for a powder material, then you also better have a calibration that is based on powder material. Mm. Otherwise, you have to make a lot of assumptions yeah. in the back. Yeah, yeah it means that basically it's still, it's, uh, uh, still possible. It means uh, one can imagine that you are using an uh, oil standards and provide also value for the matrix like CH. Um, and those oil standards are available in, in, in good defined matter or in aqueous solution of a, of a trace element. And then when you go to your real sample, which can be a powder, you also need to provide the matrix information. And so mm -hmm. the software is capable in, in calculating the different matrix influence and, uh, factors. And uh, so it's, it's still possible. There might be a little bit less accuracy, but uh, yeah, you are, you are doing in uh, validation as well, which is also important and mandatory with the certified reference material that you are making sure that this calibration also works for your purpose. So it's not impossible. There might be some limitations. The only thing which is vital there that you provide the entire sample information. Mm. Maybe one last comment on calibrations here. I'm not sure if that was clear for everybody in, in the presentation. The point here is with XRF, you really do a one-time calibration. So you calibrate your system, and then you monitor the performance of your calibration with a quality check. You don't have to do daily or weekly uh, recalibrations. Um, so it is really an effort that you do at the beginning, so you make that uh, as good as possible for your needs, and then you're ready. Yeah. Maybe just one um, uh, question more related to calibration. Often the um, elements exist as oxides. Um, do we also get quantities, for example, for titanium or for titanium dioxide? Yeah, actually, we, we are analyzing or we, uh, the radiation comes from the titanium. And now when uh, we, we know it's an oxide, we can uh, calculate from the titanium signal to the uh, titanium dioxide concentration simply by stoichiometric uh, calculations. Nevertheless, uh, there might be some tricks uh, needed uh, when you have uh, pure titanium or another titanium compound and you have titanium oxide. So then uh, you, you need some more tricks. Uh, and there, we, of course, we can, we can help you. Or you would go back and calculate just titanium in the entire sample. So what is also, there was a question here uh, coming up that uh, sometimes uh, tablets might have a kind of coating and you are interested in the coating. And the, the inner body, the, the, the uh, uh, pressed powder body, basically has a different compound. And our software also provides a uh, penetration depth. So actually, you would see in the software, so what is the analyzed sample layer? 
And this information can be used to, to distinguish between the uh, coating and the inner body of a, of a pill, right? Mm -hmm. Another question is here uh, related to um, the primary methods. So how has it to involve a primary method such as AS if you want to quantify with XRF? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically um, XRF, besides uh, what we mentioned about the standardless solutions, is a method that needs references, reference materials for calibration. And in uh, pharmaceutical applications and cosmetics applications, the typical way is to use uh, ICPMS or AAS uh, uh, methods as secondary references. There are, of course, also some uh, um, certified reference materials available for certain substances, but oftentimes, especially when we are talking about uh, production monitoring, we talk about very specific materials. Uh, then it makes most sense to have a range of your production material measured uh, once or, or as duplicates or triplicates at the ICP and then using those values and those samples to calibrate um, the XRF instruments. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it means the straightforward uh, way to uh, calibrate and to validate uh, XRF would be certified reference materials. There are a lot available, but sometimes they don't match your production sample. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you can use another method as validation. Uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, even if we are used to, to, to di digestion, for example, it's not always uh, the, the complete answer because uh, when you are digesting uh, in assisted acid digestion of, uh, with a microwave and you have titanium oxide or you have chromium oxide, you won't have the entire 100% recovery. Nevertheless, since XRF is working out of the, the powder, we actually see the entire uh, sample amount, the entire element amount, where ICP or AAS due to the acid digestion would see only maybe 80% uh, because the rest is as, as unsolute uh, uh, oxide in, 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 uh, in the nebulizer. So therefore, uh, the validation is always a little bit uh, tricky and, um, but yeah, actually we can help you or there is tons of literature about it uh, when you're setting up and making the validation uh, to document those uh, an, an, uh, agreements and disagreements. Perfect, thank you. Uh, there was also an, a number of questions related to the sample preparation. So what is the best sample preparation procedure for liquids? Gel and suspension cosmetics, for example, and also for some other materials. Maybe could you summarize that briefly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, for liquids and, and gels, and also like we showed in, in, uh, in, the, in the lab, like Renata showed for the, the shampoo, uh, lotions, anything, you would basically put them in straight into a liquid cup. Uh, there's nothing more uh, you need to do to those samples and then measure them straight away. Mm -hmm. um, the only exception is maybe what we also showed is you if you want to measure really light elements like fluorine, then it might make sense to, uh, or it's actually a prerequisite to dry the sample so you can rid get rid of the foil. But in 99% in of the cases, you would measure them in a liquid cup. Yeah. Yeah. There are maybe some, some tricky samples uh, and, and, and uh, there we, uh, our application team will help you. Means there, for example, if we have a heavy matrix, we have inhomogeneous samples, uh, and there's also a trick to, to mix it with a more defined, uh, for example, like uh, active carbon, uh, and you mix it and, and form into a pellet. Drying a sample and pressing the sample is a trick uh, Mm -hmm. And there, there can be also, if you think about a, a solid or kind of more solid grease, you can use a cup and, and, and uh, press the grease into this cup. Um, so there, there, are, there are some uh, more tricks for, for special samples available. Mm -hmm. There are tricks like uh, if you have small amounts, you can use two polymers, uh, put the sample amount between the two polymers and, and then introduce it to the instrument. So there are tricks, and, and uh, we can support you with those tricks uh, to, um, yeah, to help to get, feed the sample into the instrument. Yeah, and you can add those information to your standard operation procedures so that the preparation, even though it may be not, at the beginning seem not so straightforward, is very reproducible. You know? mm -hmm. 
There was also a, um, a question related to the safety of XRF instrumentation. What is the safety precaution from a radiation to the analyst? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty easy. There's no way in operating a Bruker XRF instrument and being irradiated. So it's a fully pattern approved instrument uh, and there is no way that you can switch on the X-ray tube if uh, there, there is the protection not active. So when you are removing the side panel, uh, actually in, uh, there are safety switches and they, in, uh, in, uh, the XRF production or the X-ray production is blocked. Also, in, uh, the X-ray tube is only activated when the shutter is uh, completely closed. And uh, we are below the uh, typical natural uh, radiation level with our instruments, so it's, it's also not harmful to stand for hours next to the instrument. So the, the, the benchtop and uh, floor standing units of uh, Bruker are fully protected uh, units. Yeah, so we also have the German type approval for that, which then sometimes makes the, the registration of the instruments with the local authorities more straightforward. Time is really flying, and um, there was maybe um, also, there were also a number of questions not related to pharma and cosmetics. Um, for example, for alternative fuels, how to analyze those, or about plant materials. Maybe uh, looking at these questions, I'd like to refer to the previous seminars we had, and you found we find the recordings of them on our webpage in the webinar section. Maybe there was time one short. Um, uh, question related, which we still could cover. Um, how about plant materials and, and things like forages? How would you measure this and, and what are the approach there? Yeah, so plant materials and, and forages are, for example, often measured as dried forage um, and also grounds to, to relatively uh, fine powder, like it's also on an FTN and IR instrument. Um, in some cases, some of our customers like to press these materials, especially when they're looking into lighter elements, but you can simply measure them in a liquid cup, but here you need to create some homogeneity by grinding them, and you need to get rid of the moisture uh, by drying them. Uh, this will help you a lot uh, to get more precise and accurate uh, data. Mm -hmm. yeah. But like Frank said, uh, regarding questions like this, we, we have um, um, similar webinars available on demand. Um, for, for other applications, including feed and forage. Yeah. And, and yeah, don't, don't hesitate to contact. Uh, ask means we are more than happy to answer your question when you have a particular problem uh, regarding uh, the preparation of a specific kind of samples or to, uh, how to calibrate. means our application team and service team will, will glad, uh, gladly help you and support you there. So don't hesitate to contact a broker agent in your territory and we are yeah we are supporting you there yes so thank you very much for all the questions you you put into our chat and and with that i would like to hand over to adrian and kai for their final words yeah thank you very much for your time for joining us today we hope you had uh, also learned something yeah yeah it was also a pleasure for me to get all your questions it means it shows that uh, you are actively listening and that um, from the feedback we got from the uh, last webinars, uh, there were positive comments about the content. Let us know if we can do something else for you or how do you enjoy the, the webinar today. And yeah, looking forward to meet you again in the future. Thanks also from my side. Bye -bye. Goodbye. <laughs>